Dhaka. Baba. Welcome back to Kevin Pollock's chat show. Woohoo! Oh, hey, how's it going? How are you? I'm uh, Chat Show, just uh, texting to our guest who's uh, in route. Uh, don't think for a moment that's code for she's tardy. She's not. We got the heads up. We just decided to start the show a little early because uh, we have limited time today. Very excited about today's show here from the West Side Comedy Theater. I want to thank Sean Casey. Bryce Weisel, we think is the name to say th sure. that last name. Weisel? Weisel? Maybe? Weasel. Not Weasel. Seems. It's not I Weasel. I just know him as Bryce. I've never been introduced. I, had, I didn't know his last name until just this moment. It can't be Whistle. Bryce Whistle. Yeah. No, I'm going to go with Weisel. <laughs> Bryce Waterhouse? Yet another Jew to block. Bryce Waterhouse, also a great nickname. And the uh, fellowship gang that runs this. Uh, and isn't Mike Patet the other fella? Isn't it him and Bryce now? They're like. Is it Mike and Bryce? Yeah. Mike and Bryce show. I do a good impression of Mike Patet. Do you? Yeah. Well, how's that? This is what he's always like. Huh. That's very good. That's very good for all the listening audience out there. Yeah. Not Every time I see him, he's like staring at his phone and looking for someone. That he just can't seem to find. Now we have a reason to invite Mike to watch the show. Just so we can see an <laughs> impersonation of him. Because let's face it, he's the only one who will get that. <laughs> um, it's true. We had a show last Sunday. I want to thank Paget Brewster for guest hosting. I understand she did a marvelous job. I've not heard the show because I refuse. Um, and her guest, J-Mac, went, it went great, you said. Kenny, you were here? Yes. Big thumbs up? Big thumbs up. All right. Um, her guest, Tim Amundsen. That can't be a name. Oh, yeah. So Almond, and then add, add a son. But that's not how it's spelled. He's on the uh, Gallivant. We, we exchange, exchanged emails saying we would share Vinnie Jones stories. More to come on that. Uh, we had our seventh anniversary show the, the Sunday before that, um, live from Largo at the Coronet. I want to thank uh, Mark Flanagan and Michael and all the folks at Largo the Coronet who support a treasure trove of brilliance, offering an intimate size audience an opportunity to see some of the most gifted and often most successful people from both music and comedy in that little tiny venue that holds like 240. Um, so we had our seventh anniversary show there. Let's discuss that for a goddamn minute. Holy crap. Colin Hay comes out. Amazing stories about Paul McCartney and the Whatnots. <laughs> that, that, his, his debut out. Al What's that? Was that his first band? Yeah, and the Whatnots. Yeah. That yeah, would Paul be a great McCartney band. And Colin Hay and the Whatnots. <laughs> Come on now. Uh, not a lot of debut albums become the number one album in the world, and and stay on the number one hundred hits list. What's the list called? In Bill music, Board? sure, Billboard. Uh, four months stayed number one. Four months. Hello, this is four months. Um, so he was phenomenal. Then you bring out your Jeff Goldblum, and it's like, all right, now what? He's perfectly, delightfully crazy. He's delightfully nuts in the most harmless, entertaining way. No inner monologue. No inner monologue. Just rambles. Uh, and also, I love his ability to digress. I have to master the impression. Uh, J Mac, please make a note. Corey as well. Corey Levin sitting in. Hi. I I do I do want to get a clip of some Goldblum rant from that episode, you guys, so that I can listen to it and and bore down into what will become, because he has more ticks and, and. This is actually a great example of inner monologue because this is like a production meeting that you're having while on air. While so on camera. Is, yeah. Huh. So. Interesting. Without the, all the digression, so he'll digress to like a seventh level. Inception. He inceptions himself. It's pretty amazing. I like that he in notes. 
And he had brought, uh, brought a little cheat sheet of notes. Yes, it was it, almost like a cocktail napkin. It was unclear a few minutes in who was interviewing who. Right? Yeah. <laughs> he started asking me about movies and s insisted I did an impression of yeah. Albert Brooks, I think. I think, I honestly think he did show up expecting to interview you. <laughs> well, thank God it was on, <laughs> like he wasn't sure what the rules were. Right. It was on a little cheat sheet, smaller than a playing card, made of a napkin, it seemed. Maybe paper. And I, I instantly thought, oh good, at least he made that list. Someone didn't make it for him, because it was that much of a crazy person. If someone made that for him, they should be fired. <laughs> they should be fired. Yeah. Give me a full 8x10 piece of paper, please. That's all I ask. <laughs> all I know is, sadly, I'm running for that Independence Day sequel. <laughs> yeah, when... Uh, I know, because I know, like, the first one I loved when it came out, saw it three times in theaters. It 100% does not hold up. No, it's... At from, all. From it's day terrible. one, for those of us but who... But I will run and see the new one. Yeah, you will. For those of us who were adults when it came out, because you were... I was 15, I think, when it yeah. came out. Uh, we knew that the plot had was like Swiss cheese. Yeah. I mean, every step of the way. But, but you, you're a smart, Jen Corey. You're smart when it comes thanks. to these things. And you but enjoyed you the movie when it first came out. And I, I went to see Independence Day with friends, bought everybody flags, and made little tags that said Patriot Corey and all that <laughs> stuff. I was 100% on board. Loved that movie in the Me theater. Too. Bought the laser disc. As soon as it came out, <laughs> is that a placemat now for the for the? Yeah, I probably still have that laser disc. Yeah. bring it in next week for. All right, please. See. That's not really going to happen. Nope. Um, I was completely on board with Independence Day. Loved it for a long time. I, I don't feel that way anymore. No, it doesn't <laughs> hold up. Sadly. There were so many plot holes that by the time they got to the end, uh, spoiler alert, where they <laughs> defeat the aliens by downloading a virus. <laughs> all I can say was, thank God that the aliens had Mac, because if they were IBM, <laughs> and sleep take. Um, no sequel, if they'd had IBM. <laughs> if they had IBM, there'd be no sequel. Uh, but I too, I, you know, listen, I saw the trailer. I'm going to go. I'm excited to see another version of this stupid movie. <laughs> I'll be over here if you need me. <laughs> um, yeah, so, so then Bill Burr comes out and has a lovely chat. We talked a lot about F is for Family and where he draws inspiration from and where the diaper kid came from. <laughs> Kenny, have you seen F is for Family on the Netflix? I highly recommend it. I oh, it's unbelievable. You'd like it. One of the neighbor kids just walks around in only a diaper and it's, it's clearly loaded. And like a wife beater and a trucker cap, I think. A little kid has like a wife beater and a trucker? I think so, and then a diaper. And, and he a, lives in an abandoned washing machine. Yes. <laughs> a loaded diaper, by the way. <laughs> it's hanging. Oh, I love it. Highly recommend the F is for Family. They got a new uh, season. It's worth it just for Mr. Coconut. <laughs> just for Mr. Coconut. Uh, and then he did stand-up, which is always brilliant, and then he alienates 89% uh, of the women in the audience at one point when talking about equal pay. But holy crap, is he one of the best comedians in the world right now. Uh, but since we were celebrating our seventh anniversary, it dawned on me that we'd not really talked about what we'd accomplished in the seven years, and I realized nobody cares. So instead... <laughs> I just set everyone up for a big fucking lie. Uh, I warned the crew that we would be talking about our seven years together. And now I just realized there's a chance our guest is going to walk through the door any moment. And I've asked uh, for J-Mac to send me every fan mail. And he sent 75, and I'm going to read a couple. Since we never get a chance to do those either, it seems like I want to include you more than us reminiscing. Unless, Jamie, you'd like to tell us right now who your favorite guest was, because I get asked all the time, who's your favorite guest? Out of two, this is 266. <sighs> Mark Maron just celebrated his 700th show. Wow. He started just after us. That's what happens when you do two a week. Times 52 weeks, you're looking at 700. I have an answer. Yeah, what's your, who's Sam your favorite? Sam Rockwell. Sam Rockwell. Just because I, it, it's exactly what you wanted from him, and just to, to knowing his process and knowing like who he steals from to yeah. make his performances brilliant, Sam Rockwell. And his dad was here doting. That yeah. was made it kind of. Special. And I just, you know, he's in my, he's on my list. You got to dance with him at a wedding party. I did. Yeah. <laughs> I have video if anybody. But, uh, but other than me. that, I would say uh, filmmakers and comedians are my favorite. Always. Of the guests, filmmakers especially, they're always the most fascinating. I think. Kenny, you got a favorite? I'll come back to you. <laughs> From Nathan Butterfield, dear chat show. Chat show, he's wondering if it's with a hyphen. Am I overthinking this, he asks. No. 
You were perfectly thinking it. Nathan Butterfield writes, I listen to your show in Bermuda, both on my iPhone and the car, and sometimes I watch it on YouTube. I got into it late, but have managed to listen to every episode, every episode, and enjoy it. You've listened to every? That is nice and easy on, in Bermuda. I've tried lots of podcasts and follow, uh, lots of podcasts and follow a few regular podcasts, but yours is one of the ones I never miss. Well, thank you. Nathaniel Butterfield. I think I said Nathan. I'm, I'm cold reading. Can anyone tell? Paul Spotswood. I watch on YouTube. And I, I am subscribed to your channel. I am 67, retired physician, and watch a few shows every month. Great work. So he's managed to keep it down to just a few shows every month. He's, he's regulating himself, knowing that they're a finite number. That seems reasonable. Right? Yeah. I'm just going to watch a couple. I'm not going to binge. Yeah. I'm 67. I'm not falling for this binge crap. <laughs> Speaking of which, Jamie and I were just in New York uh, for a big Netflix celebration of Ricky Gervais' new movie, Special Correspondence. Please check it out on Netflix. Starring er Ricky, which he wrote and directed it. Uh, Eric Bana. Kelly McDonald. Love Kelly McDonald. Going all the way back to Train Spotting, And, of course, Boardwalk Empire. I think I made the mistake of thinking she was Irish and she's Scottish, and Ricky told me afterwards, yeah, you're an idiot. <laughs> um, so great. And then Jamie and I got to have dinner with Ricky and Jane, his longtime better half. They've been together since the beginning of time. In fact, I showed them a picture from when they were in their 20s um, at, uh, at the Bobby Flay restaurant Gatto, which I also highly You're just name-dropping places and names. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, like, uh, people. I'm trying to relate to people who may in fact want to know what we do. But you're right. It's all name dropping of places and That things. whole day was a name drop. And my favorite name drop of that day was when John Krasinski told me I had a cute haircut. So we went to see Dry that Powder, a new play <laughs> at the public the theater. The day. With our pal Hank Azaria, another name drop. Claire Danes, who we don't know. Uh, who was kind enough to uh, give us a little panic cry face from Homeland. <laughs> During the play, she broke out a little panic cry face. That is one of, I think, 16 Emmys. She does panic cry face better than anyone. And then John Krasinski, who was very kind to me backstage after the show, or certainly acted very enthusiastic to see me again. And then I made a reference to Young Brain, which is what I call Jamie often when she remembers things that no one else does. And he chimed in with what comment? A uh, young brain and a cute haircut, I think, or something like that. And nobody asks what you think about her haircut. No. Unsolicited, Unsolicited, he offers up this compliment. I'll take it. Hey. Young brain and a hey. cute haircut. Whoa, John Krasinski, I believe you're spoken for. If he's good enough for Emily Blunt, I'll take the compliment. Let's work out a swap <laughs> for just one night. <laughs> Which is funny because he's not my type at all. He's no. way too handsome. Way too pretty. Way too pretty. And fit. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Dear Chat Show, I am new to podcasts, but yours was the first one I subscribed to after hearing about it on Bob and Tom. I'll be on Bob and Tom, I think, uh, uh, next Friday, by the way. Yeah, those of you in the Indianapolis area, I'm returning to a comedy club called Crackers. That's not in this email. I just decided to digress. A la Jeff Goble. What's, in, back the, what's to, in the briefcase? Back to the email. I am Crackers. a truck driver. I listen on my iPhone while driving via the Player FM app. We're all familiar with that. Your Talk and Walkin' podcast was not previously available on this app, but I sent an email to the app people and was able to get it added to their lineup. Look the fuck at that. Check out episode six. Check out the big brain on Brad. <laughs> episode <laughs> six starring Corey Lavin. <laughs> and then he offers up the Larry King game. T-shirt winner right here. Some years ago, I was attending a party with Steve McQueen, at which I attempted to ride his motorcycle. This ended badly. Needless to say, I had to have my testicles replaced by Marty Feldman's eyes. Pahrump, Nevada, you're on the air. Pahrump. That's from Jordan Pace. Hey, the Paces. I wonder if he's uh, any relation to the Paces of Pittsburgh. Of Pittsburgh. Ambridge. Probably not. Oh, they're not from Ambridge. No, no. No. Do not confuse. No. Where are, they, where are those places from? Squirrel Hill? No, what is that? 
I don't know technically what that part of Pittsburgh is. It's like it's Allegheny County, though. Allegheny County. Turtle power. <laughs> My name is Brian McCauley. And I'm a, oh, this is an interesting one. I'm a long-time listener and a huge fan of Kevin Pollack movies. Thank you very much for countless satisfying hours of podcastery over the last few years. Seven years, you son of a bitch. I'm writing because I'm curious as to whether you're still looking for interns. Hey! Be proactive, why don't you, Brian McCauley? Uh, if not, are you looking for hangers on? If not, are you looking for sycophants? Yard work. Luckily, I can perform all of these tasks and more, and that's in addition to having studied radio broadcasting for two years in college. I think you slipped in a little resume there, Brian. Yeah. I live on the west side. Okay. <laughs> in Mar Vista. <laughs> Do you need a ride? <laughs> <laughs> Aisha Tyler entering the building, ladies and Jews. I'm going to finish up this email nonetheless, but Dr. Kenny Chen, our, our floor director, will show her to her seat while I'm reading. Uh, well, I have two cars, but no spouse or pets. I work remotely as a paralegal by day, but don't let that fool you. I have a long history of working for no money. I love an intern who puts that out front. And I'm fantastic at it. If you're looking for someone to amuse yourself by humiliating, wow, this guy is going right to freak from Game of Thrones. Oh, no, Reek. Reek. Yeah, I call him Freak, but he's actually, his nickname is Reek. It's a fair nickname to call right? him Freak. Right, Freak? Yeah. Well, with the no penis and all. Um, Spoilers. To amuse, yourself, to amuse yourself by humiliating in the, in the more qualified or busy, I can deliver for you. I can deliver for you. He's really pitching. Downside includes. Downside. He's going to list his, uh, his negatives. Works too hard. My <laughs> Works sells too hard. Downside always, sells too hard. Always five wow, to there's early. a beautiful aroma that just entered the area. Must be our guest. <laughs> My five foot six body prohibits reaching high shelves. And I'm from Massachusetts. <laughs> Otherwise, it's all great. Thank you for your time, Brian McCauley. And he's, um, he's left his phone number. 949. <laughs> Wait. Wait. I shouldn't. 555. Five, five. Now you know it's fake. P.S. I'm willing to engage in combat with other candidates in a gladiator. Gladiator. Gladiatorial? Gladiatorial. Gladiatorial. I had to go to the college grad. Gladiatorial. Dartmouth. Setting. All right. Thank you, Brian McCauley. I now have to talk to our guest. Well, Brian, we'll reach out to you. Everyone needs a good intern who can sell that hard. Um, please welcome, let's waste no more time, Aisha Tyler. Aisha, hello! Hi, hi, I'm sorry I'm tardy. No, no. Unacceptable. I told the listeners and viewers you were not tardy. We, we were starting early. Oh, okay, good. Because right. we had such limited time. Yes, yes, you've got, this is, you've, you've got, uh, I don't know what's happening after this. I imagine it's exciting and important. You uh, have just come from a ADR session? I just did my first ADR session for the movie that I'm making. Yes. Like, uh, just this morning was like the beginning of the making of my movie, which was really exciting. Let's talk about this first, why okay, don't we? Okay, let's and, do. And welcome. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Thanks for having me. We have ice cold water for your mug. Let's fly that in. Ooh, right here, is, Kenny. This is a very, first of all, this is, these, these are the nicest uh, mugs I've ever seen. A oh, travel it's, version of that. It's like a tactile. Wow, just the worst. Like, like, a, like you, I can literally feel, <laughs> literally feel Kevin up here. It's like really. Yeah, it's a little yeah, tactile. Yeah, thank you. Sure. Um, Careful, there's a little, <laughs> little bend in. J Mac in the crow's nest is laughing because every week Kenny finds the single most awkward way to get me the water. When in fact he could just step up and hand it to me. No, no. Anytime, no. Stay out of frame. Out of frame. So let's get back to the ADR session. So, yeah. so you're starting with ADR. Does that mean it's animation? No, no. no. It's actually, um, it's really interesting. It is. There's one character that's on screen. The movie takes place entirely in a car. Sure. And so a big part of this whole story is him talking with different people on the phone. So all the other characters are all going to be recorded and then laid in as phone calls. Oh wow. And He'll be in the car. He'll be on screen the whole time. Holy yeah, crap. and I think people might have been familiar with the th a conceit similar to this one. Tom in the Hardy. Movie, uh, the, yeah, Tom Hardy's Lock. Yeah. And also uh, the movie Phone Booth with Colin Farrell. Sure. Um, but there's something, like, I loved Lock. I thought it was brilliant. But um, it was all at night. So really, it was really just about Tom in that car. This is uh, a movie where L.A. is definitely like a tertiary character. We're shooting it, like, day to night. So you'll see a lot of Los Angeles. Wow. And 
I don't know. You know, we do. We live in our cars here. We spend a lot of time in our cars. And, and, and in fact, like when I have to do phone calls, I'm like, like wait, wait till I'm in my car. That's when I'm going to get my work done. And so to kind of create that experience for people watching the movie, that this is how we live here. Our car is our, our office, our bedroom, our lunchroom, sure. our therapeutic, you know, our therapist's office. Yeah. For this character, as he's moving through L.A., all these calls are going to kind of create this picture of his life. So That's so um, cool. Yeah, it's pretty cool. We, did, we just did two sessions today. We have a big weekend lined up next weekend. Um, but it was so interesting because I woke up this morning and the move, we had hit our funding goal and we still have about a week left, which is great. We still, and we have a stretch goal. You, the, this funding goal only kind of gets us going. It doesn't get us finished. On the Kickstarter. On the Kickstarter, yeah. So this amount of money just gets us moving, which we got moving today. Um, and we still have a couple of stretch goals to get the movie all the way done. But uh, it was exciting to get where we are now. And then I ran in and I recorded uh, two actors today, one of whom just added to the movie. Oh, I, I don't know. I kind of feel like I want to keep it a secret, but I got a very big movie star to do a cameo in the movie, which so is really, really exciting. Great. Yeah, really exciting. So I don't know. You've done this. You've made movies. Technically. You're a big, well, you're like a big movie star yourself, but then have you also like made films? I just recently directed a, uh, a narrative for the first time. I had done a documentary. Yeah, you did a doc. Yeah. You did, uh, you did um, the, the, the oh, fuck me. I've seen it actually too. The Aristocrats. I was going to say something, I don't know, the Gentiles? <laughs> well, the Goyim? I did appear in the Aristocrats, but then I directed a documentary called Misery Loves Comedy. Okay, yeah, yeah, which uh, came out last year. Yeah. Yeah, and we promote, I tweeted it out and pushed that out. Yes, you did. You were very I kind did. to I'm support fine. and help. Fuck yeah, anytime. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I'm, it's so hard to make a movie. It's just so difficult to make a movie. And I'm yeah. not whining. Well, what's the uh, genesis? Of this film? And is it called Wait Till I'm it's in My Car? Because if not, exactly, it should be. It's exactly. Rolling Calls. Uh, it's called Axis. Mm -hmm. um, Axis? Axis. A-X-I-S. Which uh, has like kind of two meanings. It's... it's um, there's a very specific relationship in the movie between the lead and his therapist. Mm -hmm. And so uh, Axis, I think, is, is the name of one of those diagnostic books. But it's also about how your life can kind of pivot and turn in a second and change for mm -hmm. you. And this guy, the lead character, um, he's, a, he's an actor who's had some success in Hollywood. And because of his own kind of self-destructive behavior, has pretty much wrecked his whole life. Wrecked his career, his personal relationships, his familiar relationships. His life is kind of in a shambles. That is so great. Yeah, and so... And, and, and so, so familiar. Realistic, so familiar to, to all some. of us on some... Exactly. And then he's starting to kind of piece his life back together. He's getting sober. He's starting to piece his relationships back together. And on this one day, because the movie takes place over one day, everything starts to crumble and devolve. And it's about him kind of racing towards trying to save his own life and also save the life of the people that he loves. So wow. it's interesting. You know, it's it's contained. They always tell you to do your first movie, you know, contained space and a so certain location. Chose one so set. I chose a car. Yeah, it's a set that moves, luckily. But um, So you will have cameras in the car. The camera, the car will be loaded with cameras. And the cool thing about this premise is, because we have very little time, I have to shoot this in nine days. I only have nine days off this year to do this. Um, uh, I'm sorry, you just slipped in. I I only have nine days off this year. This year, I only have nine days. Yeah, to you, you make went, it, uh, Was that? <laughs> I got into, <laughs> I that I like that a, got into your paragraph. Like a workaholic name drop. Uh, <laughs> I, I I only have a week off this year to to do anything. So. Um, what does that mean? Well. Uh, look, I'm in an unusual time in my life. I don't take it for granted or think that it's like normal to be as busy as I am. And I remember vividly watching hours of Nickelodeon Jr. while making ramen noodles. That was the most of the first decade. Nickelodeon Jr., anybody? <laughs> anyone, anyone, anyone? You came in late, so you <laughs> perhaps not that was met uh, Jamie and Corey, our two sidekicks. Okay, hi, Jamie's Jamie. our head writer. And uh, <laughs> it's nice because they're, they're totally unisex names. They are. Yeah, I like it. You could switch up and you my, could just... I, my, my name is Jamie Fox. I have a completely That's unisex name. That's fucking awesome. Completely unisex. God, God, horrible. Just walk into to a bar and let the ladies fall on your non-existent penis. Yeah. <laughs> Jamie Fox is in the house. Like, or wrong the one, but get in here anyway. Come on, <laughs> see what you can do, ladies. <laughs> nah. yes, impress me. Just give me a moment for that video. Yeah, take, take it home with you. Um, so what was the question of, oh, about only having nine days? Well, so it's the X111, or is it called eight? Yeah, uh, 11. Okay. <laughs> 11. Are you still so shooting 13? Guys, that was 13. Was, Are you still yeah. shooting 13? No, I'm done with that. Right. Okay. So right now, I'm on the talk every day yes. on CBS. And then uh, I do Archer, Archer, the animated show Archer. And then I host Whose Line Is It Anyway, the new version of Whose Line Is It Anyway. Right. I took over for Drew. And then um, last summer, last August, um, I joined Criminal Minds just as a little right. baby arc, just to do six episodes. And that turned to, into... To take, someone was taking a few episodes off. And then that ended up being 
being the whole season. Please that ended stay. Up being 18. Yeah, which was nice. You know, I mean, I, I'm, I'm well behaved. I clean up after, after myself. I don't steal all the cookies from craft services. You know, I share. I play uh -huh. nicely with others. Right. Uh, I think they were just happy that, that there was someone who, you know, just showed up on time and knew their yeah, lines. Yeah, knew their lines. <laughs> like, oh, show this went on 10 years. Yeah. Or more. Yeah. The uh, yes. No, they're lovely. The thing is that cast, that the cast that's been there since the beginning, they're lovely, lovely people. But I think it's very hard if you're a newcomer sure. to come into a, like to get onto a runaway train and, and fit in. You right. know what I mean? And I think for some reason I just was a good fit for the show and right. so they asked me to stay. So I, I did the whole season, so I was kind of doing the talk in the morning until like one and then going there until like ten or midnight or sometimes three in the morning and then going back to the talk the next morning at like seven or eight. So it was a, it was an interesting year. And you know it's only I'm April. Sleepy. Yeah, I, 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 I mean, it's May tomorrow. I'm living in a tesseract. I have no idea what time it is. Um, and then if I do go back to that show, like the the talk has a hiatus in August, but that show goes back in July, so I'll, I won't have a hiatus this year. So I'll just go. I'll just work. Right. The and idea. and um, all signs point to yes. I imagine their show has been on ten years, unless. Someone I, decides otherwise. Yeah, it's doing. It it's doing. It, it was. We had a great season, and it did. I don't. Know, I mean. Uh, I don't know, I haven't been there long enough to be to say we, but the show had a great season and, and it looks like it'll come back and yeah, I don't know, you know this business, you never take anything for granted. No, yeah, oh, that's no. mistake number one. All of my money is in my mattress, not in my home in an undisclosed location. No, mm -hmm. uh, the research, you know, we have a dossier on every guest and it does in fact say I like a dossier. you have a mattress at Wells Fargo. <laughs> exactly, inside the safe yeah. is a mattress filled with all my money. That's so weird. <laughs> I have a safety deposit box, but you went ahead and put a mattress. A whole mattress, in just just for nostalgia's sake, it's full of bitcoins. Ouch. Yeah. <laughs> uh -huh. Very uncomfortable to sleep on. Um, Joe Montana, nicest person that's oh, ever God. lived. Like Tom Hanks is a dick in comparison. There, it, it, it's it's surreal how nice Joe is, yeah. and sometimes you're wondering, like, if he goes inside his trailer and like drinks like baby's blood or something, right? Because he's like filled with niceness. It like radiates out of him. Crazy sweet. He's the sweetest, yeah. and considering how accomplished he is and how long he's been in the business, he has no right to be so lovely. No, no, no. And an award-winning handgun uh, target. Guy, yeah, like a yeah. And a, like a gun enthusiast and a collector. But but specifically gathering awards and for trophies shooting. for shooting a handgun at targets. Oh, good. Thank God at targets, not at people. Well, so probably he's prepared. I think he is Those ready. Those of you out there looking to break into a home right. in the greater Los Angeles area, I, yeah, here's don't hoping go to it's not the Montana. I feel like Joe goes to bed every night with a T-shirt that says "Come at me, bro." Yeah. You know what yeah. I mean? like he's <laughs> waiting. He's waiting. Not for the you. house you were looking for. No. Um, fellow Bay Area baby. Yeah. 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 It's, Do you uh, get home? Do you get up to the Bay? Sure, of course. Yeah? Uh, you have your family up there still? Technically. Yeah. <laughs> My brother and sister-in-law were just here. We just met them at the Disneyland. Oh, that's nice. Uh, was little... that yesterday? Thursday. Jesus. Two days ago. Do they have little yeah. people? They blended. have the wee, wee people? Well, the wee people have grown. Uh, okay. So deep, the adults going to Deep Disneyland. into their 20s. Oh yeah, no, just the parents. Oh just wow, the parents and us. No, we're season pass holders. This is oh, the thing. That's exciting. I can't do that. Yeah. I can't do outdoors, heat, or human beings. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. So that pretty much strikes <laughs> Disneyland. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well. <laughs> I, but I, I'm excited to hear about other people. It's like you have to be a specifically kind of joyful person, especially as an adult, to tolerate the heat and the outdoors and the pavement and the people. You know what's yeah, interesting? It's funny because as much as I love Disney theme parks and the, and I uh, I don't really like people. Like yeah, I I'm hate not a the fan like I hate the airport. Right? Like I hate TSA. So like your I love for that. Disney is overwhelming. I just like, yeah, I just kinda like it a little bubble. Yeah. I realized this two days ago we were there that uh, it I'm also overly self aware. Like I'm aware of what people are doing like three steps ahead of them. Yeah. So I can like avoid them. She's like, helpful though. She's like a ninja, right? Yeah. yeah. So I'm, oh, a yeah. I'm a Disney theme park ninja. I sense movement. She movement is. is happening. Yeah. But also the, the people around you do sort of blend in. Because I don't do well in it's not it's not people I think we're not fond of. It's mm -hmm hundreds and hundreds of them it's the crush of in humanity. your airspace in your space which is why i'm not a big fan of new york where we just were mm -hmm. for more than four or five days i don't get the massive humanity yeah issue weirdly there. i love new york and i don't know what that's about but there is something about everybody in new york being like in their own kind of like siloed track right like for the most part no one wants to interact with you in new york right they're all they're Avid, like actively trying not to make eye contact. Earbuds so, are the greatest thing in the world. Oh for yeah, New listen to music and just jam, and you never have to see or deal with anybody. Yeah. Um, or podcasts. Maybe they're listening. to They're podcasts. all listening to our podcast. I yeah. mean, if they're not, then you know, 
Welcome. Yeah, the assholes. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I like New York in small doses too. I feel like it's energizing a bit there because there's just so much shit, right? And it's all, it seems more accessible than LA. I feel like LA is just, I love it here, but I just feel like it's so hard to get anywhere, anywhere. and do anything. Yeah, you can get anywhere in New York, but there will be 5,000 people on the sidewalk in your face between yeah, here and there. Maybe urinating on you, maybe not. <laughs> do, you play, do you still play there a lot? Do you, do you stand there a lot? No. In fact, uh, I'm going out this weekend to do a gig, and I realized I had taken a year off because mm -hmm. I was working on a TV show, mm -hmm. and then I uh, directed this movie, yeah. and it took every uh, square inch of my life for a year. I had not done a set in a club. Oh, I haven't done a set in a year and a half. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, it's a um, bizarre feeling. It's very strange. Yeah. When you've been doing it, you've been doing it a little longer than I have, but uh, You're like very a, kind. You went just a little, like a year longer. <laughs> um, but like you know, I've been doing a lot. When I was like ten, like a ten-year-old comedian, like if I took a few weeks off, like I was in a panic, like I've forgotten how to do it. What what's going to happen? And now I'm doing it like twenty-three years. I feel pretty confident I can I can squeeze something out. You know what I mean? Get up there, I can like eke out a set. Like I'm not, but it is weird. Yeah. to have it f feel so remote like so in the past like the last time I was on stage yes and yeah. also the 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 notion of am I really going to listen to my act from a year ago to remember remember it? your material yeah because that's what that's what I'd have to do is I have to listen and also you're the you know when you're doing it all the time it's this rhythm evolving animal it's growing it's yeah. changing but the core of it you understand and so but when you haven't done it at all for a long time just get me back to the core please. just just can I just get the beats of it like what's yeah. my closer you know where, where are my callbacks located um yeah so the the, the stand-up started so young for you also I mean I was How old crazy you young I was literally 10 years old that's brilliant lip syncing comedy album god that's so in great. front of people though not yeah, just yeah yeah uh, that's um, good because you were being funny in front of people but you were lip syncing so you weren't you were like I have to work on material not my material all I have to do is mime this out yeah <laughs> I mean, if only the person who I was lip syncing hadn't then become a serial rapist, my memories oh, of it would be so we much all more, feel that way. more fun. Right? I mean, I remember repeating all of his material, like, ad, you know, like verbatim in the car. Like, yeah. It's just, it's heartbreaking. Yeah. It's it, a, that's, that's heartbreaking. I'm heartbroken. It, it is. Heartbreaking is the, is the absolute word for those of us in, in that performer's mm -hmm. world. Who loved him and admired him and, I mean, sat at his foot for advice. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's just... Yeah, and the great storyteller that broke every boundary there was in front of And I, I had Brian Cranston on the show, and in doing research for him, found that he was one of only two people on the planet who had won an Emmy for Best Lead Actor in a Drama uh -huh. three years in a row, wow. and the other person being Bill Cosby for wow. I Spy. Yeah. And that's a trivia bet you can win in any bar in the country. I'm taking it with me, yeah, thank yeah. you for that. And I'm not <laughs> going to give you credit. <laughs> no, you don't have to. Um, uh, so, so speaking of which, how much fun was it being the only, and I'm getting this from the dossier, the only black kid in your school growing up and being six foot tall by the third grade? Oh, that was really, it's great. I mean, it's... It, these are your own words. These are my own words. Yeah. And, uh, and there's nothing like being a pariah for a variety of reasons. You know what I mean? Like just only black kid, super tall. My parents were vegetarian. You know, I mean, during Black History Month, I was the exhibit. They were like, we have a Negro in our natural habitat. And, and glasses apparently that could ki kill I ants. See, oh yes. No, I can kill ants, kill human beings if I focused on you long <laughs> enough. I remember vividly one year, like like eating my lunch like behind the school building. There was like a there was like a, a like a, maybe like a two foot opening between the building and the fence, and it was just easier to isolate. I was like, I'm not gonna let you guys isolate me. I'm just gonna isolate myself and self isolate. I wanted to be back here alone listening to you know KRE, soft and warm, the quiet storm wow. on my transistor radio. Wow. Uh, yeah, no, I was very, I was very. And, but I'll tell you, as a comedian, that also isolated you, by the way. <laughs> yeah, you were listening to so like old people music. <laughs> Everybody likes soft rock and jazz. Um, no, it's no. soothing. It's very soothing. It's very soothing. You, you think you don't like it until it comes out, and they're like, "Oh, it's not so every twelve-year-old no, seeks it out, though." Kid. Kev. Here's the thing, though. I I was such a strange kid, and I think that eventually, like embracing that is what made me this person, like maybe this artist, you know what I mean? Made me an observer, made me curious, yeah. made me brave, made me unafraid to embarrass myself in front of a crowd of people. Right. For the, you know what I mean? Like it just, it gave me a fearlessness because I feel like I had already kind of, I think all the kids that were like really popular when I was young, and I don't know if you had this experience, like the, like the guy, the guys that were hot and got laid and the girls that were like, you know, everybody wanted, like they just peaked. They were just done. Yeah. You know what I mean? They never had to work for anything and then as soon as life got hard, they just fell apart. Whereas 
I think I just that adversity kept me moving forward all the times when club owners said, we don't want to hire you, we don't think you're funny, you're too dirty, or you need to be more like Def Comedy Jam. And you know, and I was like, you know, people told me they didn't like me before, go fuck yourself. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I'm grateful for it, really. It, 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 you know, weird kids make very interesting adults, I hope. I mean, I think I'm fascinating. But, um, <laughs> but at the very least, I'm not afraid of rejection. You right. Know, yeah. You have to endure. In I prison. think once you hit the the breaking point of being self aware of how odd your situation is, yeah. then you can climb uh, to great heights. Yeah. And either you embrace your singularity, right? Either you just say, okay, I'm just a weirdo and let's go for it, or right. you try to be more like everybody else, which in the end is just, I think, a failing proposition. Right? Yeah. It's just boring. And, and but we're looking for uniqueness anyway, so that I think you, you struck the right. Uh, the perfect outlet and career. Yeah. Now sit there uncomfortably if you don't mind while I... Have, I that's what I've been doing so far. While we... Ha <laughs> ha! Hey, hey! Guys! Uh, while we break for this important uh, ad read by, uh, well, me. This yeah. is going to go great, you and guys. And then that happened. And we're back. <laughs> and thank you to uh, Hal.fm for being a wonderful supporter. Now, um, I want to get back just for a moment, if you don't mind, to a great motto of your father's. Get it? Get in, get it done, have fun, get the money and run. Oh yeah, my father. My father's the king of aphorisms. Let me repeat, uh, get in, get it done, have fun, get the money and run. Which could be a model for a job or for a very effective uh, prostitute. One or the other, you know what I mean? I was thinking second story, man, but all right. <laughs> Little B&E. Um, yeah, no, my dad is the king of, of aphorisms. Of mottos? Of mottos, yeah, I mean, he would, he would say, and it, it, this was like the one when I was young, like eight, nine, ten. You know, yeah. He'd say he, when I'd leave for school, I'd go, "Whose day is it?" I have to say, "It's my day." And then he'd go, "And what are you gonna do?" And then I'm gonna, I'm gonna grab it by the balls. <laughs> and he taught you. To yeah. Say that. Oh yeah. Very young. And what are you gonna? I'm gonna twist. I'm gonna twist him. I'm gonna twist. I have to do that. And then I, then I go to school. Wow. Yeah. My dad was no like age, no, no, no sense of age appropriateness, but very enthusiastic about me winning. You know what I mean? Jamie has this thing where she gets along with children faster than anyone I've ever seen, especially someone who doesn't have their own, because she speaks to all of them like adults. Kids love that. Yeah. They like being treated like people. I'm like that too. I'm not really a big fan of like goobity goobity goobity. Oh no, no baby talk. Yeah. Yeah, and I also am, I'm I'm like I've, I'm emotionless when it comes to kids freaking out. Like the oh. kids are like I'm like man, I, it's it's hard to be you. I bet, huh? Yeah, really that's all right I am. Yeah, I'm nothing for them. I'm nothing. I'm like, and you keep doing that. It's not going to change anything, bro. Go nuts. <laughs> they just kind of stop at that point because they realize that they, there's no nope. no sucker here, no safe quarter. No. Are you still surprised that you didn't contract gout or scurvy, considering the amount of riceroni <laughs> you and your dad had when you were young? <laughs> we go deep. We go, we go deep. deep. With You're the thinking deep. You have a research department. They're very comprehensive. Uh, no, my dad's favorite dish was this riceroni with raisins. With raisins. That was his. It was his flourish. That yeah. was his. Yes, crazy crazy his creativity. Stuff. You know, single dads. Uh, <laughs> and then um, uh, sometimes he would put spinach in it, and that was like how he was preventing me from getting. I lived on like meat and carbohydrate sure. products for all of high school, which worked out great for me. And I, it's amazing how much butter I ingested. Like I, that was just back when butter was like an okay thing to eat. Yeah, it just yeah. was like everything was so buttery. Right. That's, that's why I don't have wrinkles because I was very moist. I was a very moist teen because I just had butter kind of working its way up my face. Do you know why pound cake is called pound cake? Because there's a pound of butter in it. Mmm. Shouldn't be eating that shit, man. No. I don't eat that like that anymore. And so I, I'm like a sad paleo. I'm like a miserable L.A. paleo person. It's unhappy eating that. I eat so much steak. Either I'm going to live to 100 or I'm going to die tomorrow. Uh, <laughs> we're going to see. There's no in between for Guys, you? Feel free to take bets. It might all be over soon. How was Dan's reaction when uh, you announced that you were going to use your Ivy League uh, degree in poli-sci environmental studies from Dartmouth to gain entrance into the sophisticated to the point of snooty world of stand-up comedy. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, I used to do a bit where I told my mom I wanted to be a comedian, and she was like, is that a kind of doctor? <laughs> like, a, like a proctologist, comedianologist? Um, but one thing I will say about my parents is they were, they were both artists, which I think is why they didn't want me to be one. Sure. Because they knew how like incredibly unlucrative it had been for them. But they're also super supportive. Like my mom calls parents to tell their kids to do something practical, dream killers. So she was like, I'm just not going to be a dream killer. Like, do your thing. And I had the degree, right? I could always go back to the office job. So I think... So this happened after... After college. I'd gotten the degree. I was doing like sketch and improv and stuff in high school and you college. You were working a little bit. 
and I had a day job. Yeah. I was working at an advertising agency in San Francisco, right. which was a great place to make flyers for my stand-up shows. And um, and so like it was you great. I had still the, oh, smell I had the this, mimic. Oh, it was great. Just the old Xerox running mm, them off and, I, and using like Comic Sans sure. the flyer pages. But um, I invited my dad to like my first stand-up show, and it was at the Punchline. Uh huh. When I first got my first real gig at the Punchline. I invited my parents, and I remember that I literally had like a, I think it was Jan or, or Cindy, like a like a, on the Bra like on the Brady Bunch when she gets onto the game show and she sees the light. Like I could see my mom's glasses like reflecting out of the audience. Dear right? Lord. And I just for I literally forgot my act, and um and then I and I got off stage and my dad said, Well, you were all right. <laughs> You remember that? Yeah, I do. I remember everything. But you're going to have to work a lot harder to be as funny as those other people. I was like, you know what? Thank you for the honest <laughs> feedback. That's unvarnished. Not at all encouraging. Um, and then I would not let anybody I knew come see me do stand-up for like years. I was like a baseball player. Like right. I had lucky socks and a lucky shirt. And no, no one I knew could come see me. And, and, then, and then even after that, they had to sit in the back where I couldn't see them. Wow. It took me a long time to recover from that night. Um, you mentioned the punchline, and I wanted to ask you uh, something in in a category I'm, I'm going to save for a moment while I remember. So I'm so old, the punchline was a dressing room for the old Waldorf Bill Graham's music room. Interesting. And then he agreed to let it be this comedy club. This kind of standalone space. Open it up. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I remember he would come, Bill Graham, one of the greatest concert promoters of all time, so he would come sometimes and hang out at the bar at the back of the room at the punchline. And I remember getting off stage one night, I think I was just the middle act at that point, mm -hmm. and saying, uh, hey, how's it going? And he was, you know, really loved all the comedians and was, he was so harsh in the music world, but to comedians he was an angel. So we didn't know when we heard these terrible things about Like Bill who Graham. was that guy, yeah. Yeah. And he said, uh, great, I just came from seeing what will definitely be one of the greatest acts in the history of rock and roll, and nobody knows nothing about this guy yet. And I said, holy shit, you've had a ridiculous career to have said something like that. Yeah. He said, well, you know him when you see him. He's like a combination of Jimi Hendrix and, um, oh shit, uh, the great uh, I Feel Good. Oh, um, James, James Brown? James Brown, James Brown Jimi Hendrix. And, and maybe some Michael Jackson. But mm -hmm. he plays one of the greatest guitars I've ever seen. He said, the only problem with this guy is his fucked up name. And I said, what's the name? He said, Prince. What the fuck's he going to do with that? <laughs> so literally the first time Bill Graham booked Prince, I happened to speak to him That's after the incredible. show at the bar at the That's incredible. Night. I was trying, I was actually working on it. I was like, it's either going to be Prince or Lenny Kravitz. <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> Lenny Kravitz is kind of an equally fucked up name for a rock star. Yes, it, it is. sounds like your uncle. Oh, I brought, yeah. I brought bagels. I got yeah. the Ollie's. My name is Lenny Kravitz. <laughs> 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 um, but that's that's an amazing story. And now, I was also driving here. This is the subcategory I wanted to get to uh, here today. Jamie, uh, born in the early 80s, is an 80s music uh, uh, Uber fan. Okay. And I was thinking, you born in 1970, mm -hmm. you grew up uh, your formative years when you got done with the easy listening yeah. <laughs> was the music of the 80s yes. and the movies of the 80s it's and true. I'm wondering what your touchstone music from that era was and, and whether Prince was a part of it. Oh, I loved Prince. Yeah. I loved Prince, and I remember specifically the album that kind of was my album because everybody had like their I, like I saw a Purple Rain, but my album was Sign of the Times. That was the album that I listened to over and over and over again. And I felt like that that was his political album, but yeah. it was also kind of of those even for me more than Purple Rain, the the album that was like a body of work for him, mm. like it held together as an entire piece. Um, and I also liked this boy who liked that album, so I would listen to it constantly and you know write bad poetry and cry. Uh, God, being a teenage girl is the worst. Um, but but I will say this, I was also very much like a Bay Area baby, so I loved Bay Area music. And I Steve Perry. Uh, not so much Journey, Metallica. The first album I bought was Metallica's oh. Kill 'em All. Yeah, it was really into metal and punk when I was a kid. <laughs> oh. I, you know, I, I just was such a weird kid sure. that I stopped liking what I thought people should I thought I should like and I just started liking shit I liked. Yeah. So I listened to a lot of metal. I mean I saw um, Black Flag at the farm out there on what's now I think Cesar Chavez Way under the freeway when I was like 13, 14 years old and I was into Fear and they weren't in the uh, San Francisco band but um, and then you know like other Sam, like I'm trying to think of other Bay Area acts that I was really into. Um, I mean, then there was the hip-hop, like, you know, Too Short and all the, like, kind of underground guys that came out of Oakland. So I kind of had those two, like, interests. Right. Um, no Huey Lewis No in Huey there. Lewis. No, 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 no. Not I mean, you know, in there. No, Great no, Bay Area and, band. and it won't. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I remember the first concert I went to, honestly, 
Well, I went, my dad took me to see Stevie Wonder when I was little, but the f and that was the night that John Lennon had died. And Jesus. I remember I was young, I was too young to really understand what was going on, but everybody was crying, so I started crying too. Right. <laughs> it's kind of like weird sympathetic. Why guy. are all the parents like crying? Like a baby, yeah, yeah. what's going on? Something bad must be happening. But um, he announced it from stage. But um, the first concert I went to, this is so weird, it was the Scorpions. Of course. And John Bon Jovi was opening for them. What's and happening? I, I, it was surreal. And I remember me and all my heavy metal friends were like, man, Bon Jovi, they're a bunch of posers, man. And then they opened and they were like amazing. <laughs> because it was like early Bon Jovi. They were like great. You know, they were like a great performing band. And my dad took me. No, he didn't take me to see the Scorps. He took me to see Van Halen. My dad was very like supportive. Holy crap. And so, and he worked at that time for this company that delivered plants like, um, like you could rent pl uh, plant rentals for like events and stuff like that. And they delivered a bunch of plants out to the cow palace the day before and he had to retrieve them that day. So he, I put on like a plant rental company shirt and then my dad and I just walked into the back of the cow palace Shut up. and into uh, the Van Halen concert. And then my dad like sat there with me while, you know, uh, David Lee Roth rode a giant microphone that looked like a penis all over the thing and was like, I don't understand. You know, uh, you those of you listening happening. or watching, the cow palace, believe it or not, was one of the bigger venues for yeah. Great music concert. Yeah, we take it for family. granted because it's part of our vernacular. But I think listening to the yeah. words "cow palace" doesn't yeah doesn't doesn't may play not conjure yeah. as a great music I venue. Why. I think that the cow palace was called the cow palace because they used to do indoor rodeos there. I think it was like a multi-purpose. Let's say space. yes, That's as opposed to a place that that bore things through cows' heads. Okay, as a way to raise and oh no, them. that can't possibly be real. Okay. I'm going for a sexy rodeo. <laughs> I'll go for sexy rodeo, rodeo with a wonderful clown. Uh, okay, this I liked a lot. So, so care to share a few of the uh, least uncomfortable on stage moments as a stand up? But once you said about doing stand up, I get up every night saying, I've got an architecture here, mm -hmm. I've got a structure, but I don't know how I'm going to fill these rooms. Mm -hmm. Let's see what happens. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, every. I'm interested to hear actually what your like what your thought process is before you go on stage because I feel like also your process this is very wonky um, like everybody's approach like just evolves over their career right it, as you get better and more seasoned and more comfortable kind of the way you approach it changes mm. I used to have this really like carefully planned set like here's my opener blah 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 but I got a call back here I'm gonna this is my big closer and and that was fine you know what I mean your baby comic you're like oh god just let me like get laughs and sure. not die. And um, you need structure. Yeah, and you need structure. You can't function without it, and you've got to make sure that you hit your six-minute marker. You're not going to get hired again. Um, but now I really just kind of go up knowing I'm going to start here, and I feel like I'm going to end here, and then in the middle I'm just going to see what happens. And I remember like when I was a baby comedian, some of the guys I admired, besides the aforementioned rapist, um, uh, like, you know, I remember I really admired Mark Maron because I felt like when I watched him, he was, it felt like a conversation. I felt like he was just making it up as he was, now I realize he was high on coke and he was making it up as he went along. Or, or like Tom Rowe, he would say that himself. Paul F. Um, Tompkins. Or, or Paul F. Tompkins masterful. or Tom Rowe. So these guys, it just, it feels so organic and so conversational, right. even though you know now. You see them more than one. It was a set. Right. I love feeling like, oh, this is just, this is happening. Yeah. So I wanted to be that kind of a comic. Um, um, where it felt informal and it felt uh, like, like a, a conversation. conversation. Yeah, and so the better I got at it, the easier that got because I also knew in my head, well, I, I know I always can end up here at the end of the night. And Because, you know, when you're, when I was a baby comic, you just have those things, if things weren't going well, you'd just be pan literally like backpedaling and panicking, you know, like you were about to drown in water. Mm -hmm. um, but now I just, I go up and I play because I know, I always know I can like hit the easy button if I have to. Sure. Um, and tell me about your process. I'm very curious. Uh, I will, but first a break from... Oh, come on! No, no, no. From baby comic, baby dice clay. It's on the ready? spot. Ready. Oh! That's it. That's all good. <laughs> baby dice clay happened one day in the kitchen, and I, I thought, that's uh, something for the show. I have, have a few, I have a few notes. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know that was coming. It's a good start, though. It's a really good start. Thank you. Right you now, it's a premise. Usually, package. there's like a dirty nursery rhyme that comes beforehand that maybe is cleaned up a little bit, but I, that really blindsided me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry. Good work under line. pressure. Yeah. Good work under pressure. I'm proud of you. Uh, so, so, you know, be, I was actually thinking about 
the show coming up this weekend about having taken a year off. Mm -hmm. And are every you show, I, or are you anxious? Both. And I've, okay. I'm a stand-up performer who's never ever been nervous before going on stage. Yeah, ever. Yeah, yeah. it's been such a long time. I, don't I know mean, like I standing like. behind the curtain before going out to sit next to Carson. Mm, oh yeah, there's never, never nervous, been a moment of feeling nervous. It's just been excitement, like okay, your first, yeah. like Christmas morning excitement. Yeah. Like I can't wait for this to happen, uh -huh. as opposed to oh fuck, this might not go well. Right, right. That that doesn't cross my mind. But I did a set here at the West Side Comedy Theater as a, like a warm-up and it was the first time I felt nervous uh -huh. because a lot of the jokes I had written that day mm -hmm. and I hadn't done that right in, right. in a long time decades yeah. <laughs> where, I mean I, I had thought of something at the hotel that morning and then brought it on stage that night but I'd never set out to do 15 minutes based on just this material right because you'd always sandwich New Always stuff in between the protected. old stuff. Oh, it's very safe, very yeah. safe. A little hammock in the middle. It's fine. Doesn't matter. I'll bring <laughs> right. you back. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And I went out, and to the point where I had to have notes on a music stand. Oh God! Which is something I'd seen other comedians do for ever since Janine Garofalo and then decided. Miss them. Poo poo. It was okay, right. <laughs> um, but some great stuff. Uh, Corey and I and the great Ed Krasnick sat around with some ideas and premises and just sort of chewed on, chewed on them out loud. Uh -huh. And then I fuss with them and brought them together to a point where I could bring them on stage and that sort of excitement I hadn't had since I was How as you've put it a baby comic yeah um, my process has always been well a few years ago I, just, I put out this book which one of the things I want to get to talk about with yeah. you is your 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 writing process and putting out books uh, called How I Slept My Way to the Middle is my book mm -hmm. and decided to share a lot of the stories that people have, had asked about but also I'd done on talk shows as material basically mm -hmm. from the mm -hmm. couch because they've been asking forever, what was it like to work with X? And yeah. I had actual anecdotes. So having started doing just impressions, I suddenly found myself with first-hand stories of Jack Nicholson that I could tell having been standing next to him and, and him telling me <clears throat> the day that Magic Johnson was, uh, had announced he was HIV, I'm working on a few good men. And because Nicholson was the Lakers aficionado, everybody on the set, because that was one of those absolute Hiroshima bombs that went mm -hmm. off, or that was Hiroshima. I didn't know anything about it. And then the first high-profile heterosexual mm -hmm. family man. Right, uh, right. So everyone was, oh shit, this can happen to me. Mm -hmm. This is 1991. But also, what does this mean mm -hmm. about magic? Right. Right? That was the big mission. And so everyone in the crew would go to Jack. And I'd see them all day stop by and ask Jack, what does this mean? What does this mean? Like he had all the answers. Ultimately, he did. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but then walking back so, so trailer camp on a movie, uh, uh, Culver Lot, mm -hmm. right, with the base camp of all the trailers, and just being sent back to your trailer at different times, and this one moment being sent back at the same time as Nicholson. And we're just walking. I was one of the few people who, who just never wanted to bother him. Right. Didn't want to engage him in conversation unless he wanted to talk. Mm -hmm. I just felt like he had been picked at all day long. Right. But also he was shockingly gregarious and open and, and funny and hilarious, mm -hmm. which I did not expect. Mm -hmm. I expected aloof. Right, right, yeah. Right, to be that cool to six generations. Just just everything he'd done and everything he'd accomplished, you imagine he'd be a little bit more remote, yeah. even if just because people were always coming up to no, him. The right? opposite yeah. was true. Super mm -hmm. gregarious and silly and goofy. Oh, fun. Yeah. And so we're walking side by side and he turns to, and he's just shaking his head saying, it's surreal, it's fucking surreal, this whole thing with magic. And now he's just sort of talking to himself, but I'm walking next to him. Mm -hmm. And then he stops at his trailer and turns back to me and says, you want to know, Surreal? I'm doing this picture Chinatown. And I... Yeah, <laughs> you just sit what down What the and fuck is <laughs> happening? <laughs> I'm sorry, Jack. Did you just preface a story with I'm doing this, <laughs> this picture picture. Chinatown? Yeah, you might so that happened it. to me. Oh, I put it in the God. book and I realized, well, this is an act. Yeah. And I just took all those stories on stage. Yeah. And I personalized all of them. So that was the act for probably four or five years, including the, the time with the book. And now I'm going back and realizing that was my act for five years. Now what? Right. So right. I want to do a little bit of that, but also sprinkle in what the fuck's been happening in my life What's, for the last to year. You? Yeah, yeah, right? exactly. And also it seems like stand-up, like I, Dana Carvey and I started out in San Francisco around the same time. We were out to dinner with him and his wife, and uh, Jamie said, um, uh, we should stop by the West Side Comedy Theater because we were right around the corner and Dana hadn't seen the space. Well, now he does a show here once or twice a month because oh, he awesome. loves this little 100-seat cool, seat. Cool seat. Space. Yeah, it's, it's really so cool. small yeah. and intimate. You can fuck around. And Greg Fitzsimmons was here recently saying how much he loves this room. 
So that was easy for me to get up, but I found, as Dana was mentioning, which is why I mentioned his name, that you can't really do your act as an act, as a, as a structured three-act thing. Oh, in a space like this? You have to have a conversation with people. Yeah. Too, it's too, t it's too <coughs> tiny. I mean, right. the rules just don't apply. They'll smell like a routine yeah. coming a oh, mile yeah. away. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so th that's forcing me to also think about reinventing mm -hmm. and making it more conversational. Mm -hmm. Because telling those stories made it covers conversational mm -hmm. for me. Yeah. You know, I was never one of those, what if Jack Nicholson were a busboy at Michael's, something like right, that. Right, right. I never wanted to be that. Mm -hmm. But still, I hadn't had such a conversation about it. Mm -hmm. So you find going on stage <coughs> and having a conversation to be... It's just who, you know, I feel like those first years of stand-up are really not just about figuring out like who you want to emulate or what style you like. It's like who you are. Right. Like who am I on stage? I can like this guy or I can want to be that guy, but that doesn't fucking mean anything. Mm -hmm. Who am I? Who am I re like truly? Yeah. And that's a process that just takes time. You can't, you know, I mean, I remember when I was a baby comic, like older comics being like, I mean, like, what, what, you know, what should I do? What are the tricks? And they'd be like, you just have to keep getting up. And I was like, you just don't want to fucking tell me the, the trick. Fuck you. You know what I mean? Like, if you told me, I'd be felt like, you're just lying to me. What's the secret? And now people say and, that to you. And I, I tell them, I'm like, there's no, just, it's like being an athlete. You just have to run Put over and over and over again. Hours. That's it. Put in your 10,000 hours. Until, like, what happens is who you are as a comedian is revealed to you. You know what I mean? It's, yeah. That's just something that. You find your voice. Yeah. And, and what the fuck do I really want to talk exactly. about? Exactly. And, and who am I? And how do I interact with people? And I find that that and I remember also as a younger comedian of course it's great to go out in front of like you know a thousand people and it's packed and destroyed that's always enjoyable but those small shows where you do have to sometimes when you get a tiny crowd you have to talk to each person individually you have to make eye contact or you're done you right. know what I mean like there's no other way to win in a small room but to specifically engage every person in the room so they feel invested in what's happening yeah. those are the things I think that I enjoy the most and that intimacy and that kind of a personal interaction is probably the, when I have the most fun, and and then I also and then and then I also feel like when you for me when I work that way, like I can only ever be the kind of comic that tells like stories about stuff that's happened to me that feels real. You know, it's just that's I'm not a jo I mean, I I think of myself as being funny, but I but I don't think of myself as a joke writer. Yeah, you know every now and then I'll stumble or trip over a joke in my yeah. act and go, how the fuck did, how that, did that, that happen? There? Yeah, exactly. Like, wait a minute, what? Yeah, that yeah, was a joke. joke. <laughs> Actually, I set up at a punchline. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, for me, it's much more about kind of finding like humor in the everyday and this self-deprecation and, and, you know, trying to t kind of tell the truth as best I can on stage. Um, and so that's how we work because that's how I can work. Do you know what I mean? Like, I, I just don't work the other way. And I remember when I was younger being like, oh, I'm a bad writer, I'm a bad comic. I should be sitting down. I should be doing like, I should be like Gary Shandling and I should write, like, you know, two hours every day with a pencil and paper. And I just couldn't work that way. They knew. You know what I mean? And, and, and it took a long time of like feeling guilty or inadequate to realize like that's just not how I operate. So when you got to writing your two books, mm -hmm. oh yeah. What was it like with a deadline and a oh, publisher God. and a contract well, to write every day? Probably an extension of the way that I operate on stage, which is, and again, I felt a lot of guilt and inadequacy with the first book that I was able to resolve with the second one, which was, I'm a bad person, I should be writing every day, I should be doing it this way. What happened was, I wrote the proposal, which was a sketch. I sold the book, and then I didn't write it for a while. I had, like, I had maybe like six months to write it. And I was kind of dicking around and not getting to it and feeling like an asshole and sitting down and then not having anything to say. But what happened was I was processing and processing and processing and then all of a sudden the book was ready and then I wrote the whole thing very, very fast. Like, like a week or two. Because? Because it was like it needed time to crystallize it, like exactly what it was. You know what I mean? I think I had an idea there of what it was. there an epiphany? I don't know that there was a moment. It was just the same thing with me with material and I don't know if you have this experience, I think something's funny, I circle it, I circle it, I circle it, and all of a sudden the way it is, is apparent to me. And then the joke is there. Do you know what I mean? You can't force it. Yeah, you can't force it, and you, you're kind of fucking around with it. Like, I know this is funny, but I can't unlock it. Some of that stuff is subconscious, right? It happens when you're sleeping, or when you're out living your life, doing other stuff, being a mm -hmm. human being. So for me, that first book really was like a lot of, of, uh, of procrastination, and then it kind of just fell out of me. And not just because the deadline was coming, but because I was ready to write it. Mm. With the second book, I knew I knew what that book was better than I knew what the first book was. But I, and I, and I kind of just 
pounded it out very fast again, but um, not as, as much of like a sweaty, like a ball sweaty panic. You know what I mean? Like that one came, I, I kind of knew it when I, when I pitched it. Oh, I get it. Because I, you know, it's called self-inflicted wounds. And when I have people in my podcast, I get them to tell a self-inflicted wound story. And so I, it, it felt like I was, I was being a very selfish lover. Like everybody else was putting all their crap out on the table and I wasn't. So it was very easy to kind of just go through my life and write about all the times I had embarrassed myself terribly. Um, in fact, it's not even a comprehensive recounting of all of my no, humiliating experiences. But as comics, I mean, you know this, when something terrible happens to you, you're just already processing how long you're gonna have to wait before you can turn it into a bit. Yeah. You know? Sure. And everybody else is like, oh God, I want to forget that. I'm like, oh God, I need to write this down. Yeah. I can't wait to tell somebody about this. Give me one of your self inflicted from the world of show business. Oh, from the world of show business. So many. Um, oh God, so many. I mean, here's one that's not that's that's in the book. That's just like a weird tick, but I had a real fear of walking on stage with my fly open. I don't know what that was like. Uh, like an not like anything's going to come out without a penis. Yeah, but it's, I know. I know the stakes are higher for you than they are for me. But there was just something <laughs> like very anxiety provoking about maybe came, coming from my childhood of people making fun of me while That's I was right. on stage. You know what I mean? That feeling like vulnerable in that Go way. On stage naked. Yeah, exactly. And I would, I was really very panicked about it. And I, so much so that it got to be a little bit of a tick. And I would touch my fly constantly on stage, try, trying to make sure that it was closed. And I thought I was being subtle, but what happened was after I wrote the book, people would go, I used to notice that you would do that. I would literally be like checking it. I thought down, it I'd was a it. thing. It was, it was like a weird thing for me. It was like a little bit of a tick. Everybody has their things. And then one day I was, in the bathroom, somebody didn't show up, so they called me early, and I ran out on stage, Wait for and it. my fly was down, and I did maybe five or ten minutes, uh, and I could tell people were laughing, and they were laughing at the wrong time, and for the wrong reasons, and I looked down, and my fly was down, and it was like the thing I had been anticipating and fearing for all this time, and it happened, and I remember, I, it was like I zipped it up, and I yelled at the guy in the front row, I said, why didn't you tell me, I thought you were my friend, Everybody laughed, yeah. and I moved on my act, and then that was the end of that like paralyzing fear. Wow. So it was just that thing of, it, the larger takeaway from that is these things that you fear, you have to just sprint towards them headlong, because yeah. th you're giving them more power than they deserve in that's your life. That's all you're doing. Yeah, exactly, and, and you know, who gives a shit about your fly being down? I, I can't hang brain as much as I try. <laughs> <laughs> um, we do it a commercial? No, I want to include the audience who are kind enough to write to you um, from the uh, Twitterverse. Oh, exciting. At, um, I can't, Mora Bro, M O R E H. It's the H that's throwing me. Mm -hmm. B R O. Moray Bro. Sure. Okay. Uh, what did you learn from being in the Dartmouth Rockapellas? Oh, that's adorable. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I was in, uh, for people who don't know, I was in one of those kind of infernal uh, acapella singing groups. Because there wasn't yeah. an improv class available? Uh, yeah, well, we did, we did, no, there wasn't an improv class available, and we would do sketch in between songs. I mean, sure. it was just insufferable. Um, uh, uh, you know, kind of a, it's kind of a terrible hippie glee. Um, it's one of the things I love, forgive me, uh, on SNL, they've done it a couple of times, where it's like a high school musical. No, it's not a minute. They're doing the uh, they're doing like the, the the plays, but they're like all in black and it's very political. Alternative theater. And it's and very the political. And the, the whole yeah. sketch is from the parents and the audience perspective. Like, oh god, uh, why is this happening? Yeah, totally. So hard. <laughs> we we were. I, I feel at least that awful, uh, especially <laughs> at our inception. We got better towards the end, but our first year, we we were like, we have we need a look. Oh god, it's. Were you in fact part. called the Dartmouth the, Rockapella? Dartmouth Rockapellas, yeah. Instead of everybody had a clever name. Yikes. Uh, and, and we had, we used, oh, and this will also date me, we wore mock turtlenecks. Yes! Of different colors. Oh, you each had different so colors. We each had a different color. And yeah. then we sang this song, I think it was like a Yaz song. Oh, God. Mr. Blue. It's, it's so cringeworthy. And uh, and we would, oh, God, <laughs> you're <laughs> so fucking awful. Let it out. So we'd all have the colors on, and then, you know, someone would say, my name is Beth, and I'm Mr. Purple. And I'd say, I'm Aisha, and I'm Mr. Green. <laughs> and then the last person would say, my name is Lisa and I'm just Mr. Blue and then we would sing the song and it was just so fucking bad <laughs> on every level like we needed to have focus group that and we did that for a while um, 
Uh, and we were legitimately, I thought, you know, like singing wise, we were good singers, but it was that kind of perky yeah. co collegiate enthusiasm that is just so, yeah. you know, just objectionable. Um, and we would sing, you know, it was right after apartheid, we'd sing freedom songs, and oh, we, were, no. we took ourselves very seriously. Uh, I, I will say this, I'll t tell you what being in the rock has taught me. Please. Um, uh, to work a little bit more on being self aware. <laughs> To uh, to focus on optics, and um, and it did it did help with fearlessness, right? Because we just kind of we were the newest group on campus. We were constantly rejected. There was like there was literally like it was like that movie um, with uh, the Pitch Perfect. We were rejected by the older groups that were much cooler and hipper than us. They mm -hmm. wouldn't book us on their shows. But now you see there was a reason. And yeah, because we weren't very good. Uh, but we worked. We kept working until we got good enough, and then we finally did get booked on one of those shows. And it just it it you know tenacity. Yeah. Um, to never wear a mock turtleneck again. Sure. Um, it is a, a repeatedly astounding how much we learn from failure, whether we, and why we fear failure, and why we think it's such an evil, awful thing, mm -hmm. and why it isn't taught to kids early mm -hmm. that failure is the most helpful experience you'll ever experience. It's the only so way that's you something learn. to look forward to. Yeah, I can't yeah, wait to God, fail. This is going to go. This is going to be shitty. So I can learn right, something. Yeah, like I mean, like I remember being a baby comic, and like you'd walk into like a, a like a open mic at a laundromat, like the yes. back of a, and there'd be three people in there and they were all comedians and you were going to have to get up there and do your material you know you have to gut it out and I remember coming out of one of those shows at this place called Brainwash in San Francisco and a friend was like how did it go and I was like it was terrible I mean literally I did not get it was like literally like a wall of punitive silence yeah it, and I said and I started laughing I was just like god it was just so fucking bad it was so bad like there was something about that that made every set after that so much easier yeah and if you can tolerate that you can tolerate anything right. and it, it makes you creatively tough mentally tough right. you know the, my whole book is about the power of failure and and also how like how failure can make you strong but also when you avoid it you're really avoiding experiencing That's life. Right. And everybody that would come up to me after shows and go, I want to be a comedian, but I'm going to fail, or I want to be a writer, I'm going to fail, or I want to be an actor, I'm going to fail. I mean, you are. You're going to fail. Yeah, like, don't be, you're like, I'm afraid I'm going to fail, so I don't want to try. Well, then don't try, because you will fail. Yeah. But if a fear of failure is why you don't pursue your dreams, then go get a corporate job and start dying now. Yeah. I mean, failure is inherent yeah. in in braveness and there is no bravery without failure and um, and when stuff goes shitty then you just pick yourself back. I mean no you never get funnier when you destroy you just walk up there oh that motherfuckers you drop the mic and you get shots for everybody like how is that guy growing as an artist you know it's when you really scrub that you think okay what do I need to do differently how can I be better um, and so yeah I mean I think figuring that out was probably it's probably the reason why I'm, I do so much stuff now because I first of all because I've like punitive like workaholic clinical workaholism and I need help but also because I feel like I don't care if I fail like I want to do the stuff I want to do and I'm not prepared for it to go any way any which way and I'm like kill myself for it to go home. well yeah I, I mean I'm prepared it wasn't like I thought I'd just jump in and see how it went I right. trained and shadowed and prepped for 10 years I directed six short films I shadowed on every movie I was on I went I called friends were on other shows and other movies and said hey can I come shadow with you I shadowed on the wire I flew to Ireland I shadowed on Vikings like I did the work right. but if I was worried about it was about it going badly I mean I would never start you know I mean you only got the one life, you know? God, I'm like a terrible... No, no, it e turns card. out it's not a rehearsal. Okay, yeah, it isn't. You know what I mean? It's like, I mean, it's, I know that, like, yeah. it's a platitude, but it's, it's true. Yeah, yeah, no, I've been boring people on this show with mine. If you're not creating, you're waiting. And the I truth like is, that. show you and my dad should hang out. Yeah. <laughs> We have. <laughs> Show business as a performer is about waiting until you get proactive yeah. in, in whatever it is. And you're, and oh God, you're always like, please hire me, please yeah. book me, please cast me, please, yeah. please, 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 please. And everybody waiting to be discovered is going to be waiting until it's and too late. My, uh, I think we're out of time. We're out of time. Oh no. Um, I had a question for you though. You, you have to come back. Uh, this was a last minute booking and I cannot thank you enough I for I can't thank you enough for for uh, uh, having me for you know making time in a it year a that's pleasure. completely booked yeah and in the middle of my movie and you're just after your movie and I want to before we go I want to hear about your about how you feel now that your movie's done is it in the can is it finished it's is it done it's sold it's coming out in the late fall it actually happened I had to go to Bulgaria to finish it because yeah. we tried to shoot non-union in Los Angeles uh -huh. and IATSE uh, 
try to get 50% of our budget on top oh, Jesus. in order to go union, which we couldn't Yeah. because we just didn't have the money. How? What was the budget for your film? 1.8. Yeah, and they came after you, huh? Yeah, yeah, they either. wanted another yeah. 900. Jesus Christ, that, that money doesn't exist. <laughs> it didn't That's exist. Why it didn't exist. And, and it's really kind of weird, and the whole, that whole part of it I'll tell at some point, because it really was ugly and awful mm -hmm. what happened. But So I became an international filmmaker because Fabulous. we had to go to Bulgaria Fabulous. to finish the film. Right? I mean, and the thing is, <laughs> you don't know what you're capable of until you're put in that sense. Oh, yeah. Shit. I had four leads, mm -hmm. one of which had shot one scene oh, God. that I had to say, You'll go come to Bulgaria. No. Right? Oh, no. And if any one of those four had said, I can't, I won't, right. the, sh the movie would have died that yeah. day. Oh, God. So, yeah, a series of miracles and disasters. And I would maybe tour a QA and a uh, on the premise of, so you, wanna, so you think you want to be a filmmaker. Yeah. Just because of the... Um, you need, it, it needs to be in you that you want to be the most important person in terms of having the final say. The answers, every answer to everything. Yeah, yeah. yeah. that needs to be in you. If it's mm -hmm. in you organically, you'll do fine. Mm -hmm. If you need to learn how to do that. You need um, more time. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, you. Because uh, I'm not, I, I always, uh, I think part of the overview of this new uh, conversation act I want to do is, when do I get to be the crazy one? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because I've lived a life of responsibility. Practicality, I showing realize, up on time, oh yeah. And everyone around me gets to be crazy. Gets to be a nut. Mm -hmm. yeah. And yeah. I see them flourishing, mm -hmm. either in happiness or dread, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. still acting out and being a little nutty, and I, I envy it. Yeah, oh, I, want, yeah. I want to be the you crazy are, one. You and I are kindred souls. <laughs> so, so we'll get together and talk about Brilliant. that. You're still doing... Kickstarter is still going it's it ends Thursday uh, the 5th of May we're in our stretch period now so we just raised enough money with the initial uh, fundraising to start production but we still need to raise money to finish the movie so and that's what we're doing now and they should go to Kickstarter and look Kickstarter up. just look up Aisha Tyler or the film which is called Axis A-X-I-S Axis right. and uh, and there's lots I mean the great thing about crowdfunding is um, you are just giving money to a project you're getting all kinds of cool stuff back you know all kinds of sign paraphernalia and set visits yeah. criminal minds who's line archer all kinds of rewards tied to those things so you get something when you give something and then you get to be a part of the process of making a film yeah and, and making a little brown girl's dream come true oh mm -hmm. little interesting choice of words if you don't you're racist yeah clearly <laughs> against tall people <laughs> um because we had such limited time i hope uh, all of your fans from the aforementioned criminal minds the talk archer whose line is it are not uh, upset with me. I no, wanted to get. I wanted be? to get to just the you talk how this could time. They be? No, and then wonderful. through the research, I saw there's a whole lot of Q and A's about specifically. Tell us about Archer for 16 pages. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but congratulations Thank on that. You. We just went to a Bob's Burgers live thing last night and saw Ooh. the John Benjamin. Oh, fun! Have you done the live Archer? We have done the live audiences? Archer. We did two years of live Archer shows, and I think we might be doing one at Comic Con in July. Right. They are so much fun because you know we never see each other. We no. never record together. Yeah. So those are our times to be together as a cast yeah and we are all very very drunk very early in the evening and um, and then it's like kind of gibberish and hugging like a basket of wet kittens and then this is my favorite quote we can end on this but we had a, we get audience members to come up and they get to be in the scenes with us they get to act as the characters in the movie which at the show which they love you know wow. they dress up sure we pick them out of the audience and we had this one lady come up and we're dressing her backstage as Pam and she's gonna come out and I think it was like one of the space episodes we're in the space station and she's all excited and she's backstage talking to Lucky Yates who plays Craig and she goes, is it always this fucked up? <laughs> and he goes, this is a good one. <laughs> Perfect. He's like, yeah, so um, he's like, yeah, you came, you came on a, we're actually pretty, held, pretty well together tonight. But uh, people love it, and it's, yeah. we are exactly, we become our characters on the show, and it's so fun. So yeah, that stuff is cool. Yeah, yeah. well, we, 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 uh, I'll, I'll reach out, and we'll figure out a time for you to come back, because we were... We were forced. Uh, Thank you for doing this and yeah. working it out. Well, my I'm glad it all came together. I have only it. one last request. We end the show with the guest doing playing what's called the Larry King game. Okay. Um, three things. Uh, you'll do a bad Larry King impression. Don't want a good one. Don't even worry about doing anything. Okay. It even sounds like him. Okay. I want a bad Larry King impression. Uh -huh. Then I want you to reenact that moment where Larry would, before going to the phones, he would look in the camera and share something about himself. A, a favorite flavor, a memory of right, his first ride on a pterodactyl. He's old. Mm -hmm. Whatever it is, it's the Larry King moment he shares with an audience who could care less mm -hmm. as mm -hmm. to what he has to say. Mm -hmm. So you're as Larry, share something about Larry, not you, and then go to the phones 
And okay. if the name of the city is funny sounding, it won't hurt. Okay. So bad Larry King impression, share something as Larry, go to the phones. There's your camera. Oh boy. When you're ready, it's the Larry King game. Begin. Okay, here we go. I'm here with Alicia Taylor, <laughs> who has been on my show 17 times, and I'll never pronounce her name right because I don't make eye contact or remember who I got here today. <laughs> either who or how, why or where, I'm urinating as we speak, Alicia. <laughs> uh, the second one is something about Larry. No, that was, that was perfect. Just go to a city and we're done. Okay. Uh, Megato, would you like to speak to the lovely Alusha Tuller about her role on the great show, Boston Legal? <laughs> She's sensational on that show, but she looks slightly more Caucasian on film. Go! <laughs> and that's how you play the Larry King game. Thank you, thank you. It was my pleasure. Um, my pleasure. I will reach out and we'll, we'll, we'll get a second half date, please. I would love it. Yeah, I would love please. it. Thanks for having me. Fantastic. All right, sit there uncomfortably. But for the last time, while I wrap up for the folks at home, thank you again. Check out, um, it's at Aisha Tyler, yes, on mm -hmm. the Twitter? Mm -hmm. Yeah, go to and check out everything she has to say uh, um, about upcoming projects and how you can be involved. Uh, thanks to the uh, wonderful uh, sitting in of the Corey Levin, yeah, yeah. the Jamie Foxx, the Kenny Chen, the uh, Jason McIntyre and Jason we had uh, uh, sitting in for Brad sitting in for Mike Ryan Noble that's it Ryan Noble Ryan thank you again he's a big fan Ryan yeah huge fan yeah. no idea who you are yeah now you know you're part of the show if I've in fact forgotten your name uh, right Kenny yeah. yep <laughs> <laughs> Kenny said yep uh, all right, so let's it see. It took you like six months to get Mike Duman's name right. It, I said uh, Diamond, Dimon, Duman, yeah. Diamon. Uh, next Sunday, I believe we're we're taking off. Go to uh, Earwolf, check out all and uh, iTunes and the YouTube. Write to us, kpcsfanmail at gmail .com. Let us know what the fuck. I'll read some more emails next week. We got to a couple this week. And I think we might have found an intern out of the deal. Yeah. Samantha Ward on makeup. That's it for this week. Until next time, and as always, get out of my face.